So today I'm going to be talking about king snakes. I currently have three king snakes. A Florida king snake, a California king snake, and a Pueblo milk snake. Before I get into any care and husbandry, I just want to say if you're thinking about getting a king snake or any kind of snake, please do your research first. I know it's said a thousand times about a thousand different things in your life every day, but please do your research and have everything set up before you get the actual snake. King snakes can be some of the coolest pets to have if taken care of properly. So let's talk a little bit about the Pueblin milk snake first. My Pueblin milk snake's name is Phyllis. Phyllis ended up being a boy, so I just call Phyllis Phil sometimes. These snakes are beautiful animals. They've got this awesome coloration. They've got this awesome pattern of red, black, and white, or it depends on the morph and species. King snakes like this are very, very beautiful. Phyllis here is a pretty gentle snake. She doesn't really get too excited. She'll just kind of hang out there in my hand. She will musk from time to time. Kind of just depends on the day. Most of the time she's pretty chill. She's not too squirmy, but she is a baby. So she does squirm around a little bit. This snake does not bite, has never tried to bite me. It's one of the few snakes I have that have never tried to bite me. Now this is my Florida king snake. Her name is Deborah of course. Deborah is also a super chill snake. Whenever we first got her, I thought, man, this snake might have something wrong with her because she was so chill. She wasn't squirmy at all. She wasn't trying to get away. She was just kind of hanging out, and that's how she's always been. She'll do that little defensive thing where she wags her tail and tries acting big and bad, but once you're actually holding her, she is very chill. Now, uh, this is my California king snake, Stanley. Stanley's a bit of a biter, you know. I, I don't really like how people always say, you know, California king snakes... They like to bite a lot, they they always bite, so you gotta be careful with them. That's not always the case. With this one, and with him being a baby, he's very bitey. He loves to bite me. Now, I'm not saying don't get a California king snake because of that. I'm just letting you know it might take a little work and plenty of handling for them to get used to you and not be so bitey. So for king snakes, I think aspen works perfect. Having about two, maybe even three inches of aspen is just fine. They will use it for burrowing. All of my baby king snakes love to burrow, and they seem to love the aspen. Now for a water bowl, you want to get something that is not too big and takes up most of the tank because the snake might not always want to be in the water. But you do want to get something that's big enough for the snake to completely curl up in if they want to. If the snake gets dehydrated or it just feels like taking a bath, it should be able to completely submerge itself in the water with the water bowl that you have provided. So when it comes to tank size, there's a lot of debate about this, but for me personally, I say the bigger the better. A lot of people say that the length of the snake should be the length of your tank or the length and the width of the tank should be the length of the snake. I've been trying to follow the rule of however long my snake is, I want to have a tank that is long enough for that snake to completely stretch out. So for example, a 20 gallon would be perfect for a baby king snake, whether it's a Florida king snake, a California king snake, or a milk snake. A 20 gallon works really well for this type of setup. And when the snakes do get bigger, depending on the species, they could get several feet long, so you'll definitely want to consider putting them in at least a 40 gallon. Now when it comes to feeding, there's a lot of speculation on this, a lot of debates online. What I've been doing recently is with my kink snakes, when they're babies, I feed them about every five days a pinky for a few months until I can't really see the pinky in their body when they eat it. I move them up to a fuzzy, and then a hopper, and then a small mouse. With that being said, my only king snake that is currently just on a pinky would be Stanley because he's the smallest. He's the one I got last. Stanley's on a pinky about every five days. Once you move them up to a fuzzy and a hopper, you might not need to feed them as often. Maybe not every five days. Seven days would be fine. I do seven days on several of my snakes that are on hoppers and fuzzies and they seem to do fine and they're growing just fine. So a general rule for feeding colubrid snakes is that you should be able to feed the snake something that's 1 to 1.5 times the widest point of the snake's body. There are many charts and helpful resources to figure out how often you need to be feeding your snake and what the prey item should be. So when you're decorating your tank, there's never enough enrichment that you can give these snakes. Just fill that thing up as much as you can. It's not going to matter if you think it, you're filling it up too much and the snake needs more room to move around. That's not always necessarily true. I have my tanks pretty full, as you can see here with Stanley. 
I have all kinds of branches in there. I've got, of course, his water bowl. I have a ledge. I have a birdhouse in there. I mean, he has all kinds of stuff. Now, when it comes to cleaning the tanks, it's another one of those things where the, the more the better. I like to spot clean my tank at least once a week. I change out the water at least once a week, preferably twice a week. And I usually change the substrate every few months, depending on how nasty it does get. So when it comes to the heating for these snakes, it's another thing that's debated on quite a bit. I would say at least get a heating pad that is appropriate for the size of the tank that your snake is in. I also like to give my snakes the option of heating from above. I use a lamp on each one of my tanks on a timer, and I like to give that snake the option to bask if he wants to, even though these snakes don't seem to bask as much as something like a Thamnophis, for example. A garter snake or a ribbon snake might bask a little more than a king snake. If you do decide to use some kind of a heat lamp from above, whether it's just a heat emitter or a heat light or just a normal light, definitely put it on a timer, especially if it's a light, so that your snake knows whenever it's nighttime and daytime, so it has a good day-night cycle. When it comes to your heat mats, you know, a heat mat is kind of a heat mat. It doesn't matter whether you get your heat mat from Amazon or whether you get it from your local pet store or wherever. What does matter and what's very important is that you hook up a thermostat to it. You can find these online. You can find them on Amazon for about $20. And what you do is you plug in your heat mat into the thermostat and then there's a probe that goes from the thermostat into your tank or below your tank depending on how you do it. Me personally, I like to put the probe below the substrate and I tape it down with a couple of pieces of tape. One of the most important things when it comes to the heating is to make sure you have that gradient so that the snake has the option of being on the cool side or being on the hot side. So for the cool side, room temperature is fine if you keep it around 70, maybe even 69 or 68. That should work just fine. For the hot side, you want to have a hot spot about around 90 and then in the middle maybe 75, 76 degrees. Snakes are actually ectothermic which means they get their heat from outside sources, unlike humans. You can find temperature guns like this one at Walmart. This one only cost me about $20. You can also find them on Amazon for around that price. One other thing to keep in mind is your humidity. So with these snakes, you want to keep a humidity of around 40 to 60%. It doesn't have to be exact, but as long as they have good humidity for shedding, you'll be fine. Now you can find all kinds of humidity gauges online. I would say the best humidity gauge to get would probably be a digital one. The ones like these that I have in many of my tanks, they work alright sometimes, but I would say they're definitely not as reliable as a digital humidity gauge. So thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, let me know. I'll definitely be posting more of these. I'm going to try to post at least once a week, but it might be every two weeks depending on what I have going on. So thank you guys for watching and take care.